Hey there. What's up, guys? Hi. Hi, Brandon. Hello. N nice to meet you. Finally, nice to meet you, you as know? well. We tried several times, it seems. So great that, that we have you with us today. And yeah, I, I even feel that now is the, the next 30 minutes are going to be a little bit more relaxed. It was a little bit stressy for us now the last three hours, but we are still doing good. What 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 are you up to? What what what's your task in this world? Man, task in this world. The greatest thing I think <laughs> you could be is a mastery of self and a you know composer with energies. You know, just this ability to take everything around you, assimilate it within yourself, find the useful, and not be triggered into stagnancy to where you can't move by fear. So I think your greatest goal here is to master yourself. And um, anything beyond that, it's just a bonus, right? Like we get to hang out and do this cool stuff. So along the mastery of self, that path has led me to create a show called Expanding Reality. We now have a publishing house that we print journals and we're getting into printing other people's works as well. Uh, we have now events where we're doing in-person things and that is now where we've expanded to get amongst them. And so that also dovetails with my core mission, I feel at my core, which is to give people back to themselves. I think a lot of time, energy, and, and and everything else is spent here to grab your attention and direct it away from your focus and who you really are and how powerful you really are at its core. So I feel one of my deepest callings is to give people back to themselves, show you, hey, this might be just a ride and you can play, you know, it doesn't have to be so serious and dark, even though it is. And you can look at the serious and dark and still have a good time here. Yeah. Strong words. You know, you're one, of my, you're one of my most favorite people in the world. You know that. Yeah. And it's again the same, like what, what, what I said just, just before, you know. We are here now talking about these things. Uh, everyone from his own personal approach to this, but we came to this very moment in, in a very interesting time mm -hmm. because the things you just said, they fit totally perfect to what my my lady and me are just about to start this this new project you see on the back here this tag of experience research team is is my first project since years now in regards of research and now we expand to what we call the tagu academy and there we will also provide these things you were talking about to the people, you know, to, to find a way to relax yourself, to find a way to really get to know yourself, to, to learn about so many things which we did not learn or we, which we were not taught in, in school or anything. And it's exactly the right time for this type of projects to, to, to flourish, to go on, to grow. And the idea behind what we are about to do today, what we are already doing today is uh expanding our reality and also gathering more people into what what uh, what is possible and what we uh, uh provide for the people to connect researchers to connect people like you who are having their own channels their own community you know it should be a bigger community it should grow it should grow grow because we need an active change in this what we call reality and we are here to bring about this change it won't happen any any other way you know no savior will come whether this is jesus or the aliens or, or what whatever kind of uh i don't even want to say this galactic federation guy i don't know what people are waiting for projecting the responsibility to the outside and waiting for someone to come and yeah they don't really see that it's it's all up to us so very 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 great that you are here with us today i don't know if you have seen what happened until now we are now in a block of yeah two two or more english speaking people again and then we will switch into german again this is what we have to somehow since we also want to to interconnect uh on different levels we intend to translate the videos from today into always the opposite language, English or German or the other way around. So again, to 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 give more people a chance to see what 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 the others are doing, even in between the researchers. You know, sometimes one does not know the other, and 
since I'm in this game since a while with my Tago experience, I met many, many very interesting people. And I'm so happy that now we can really start to connect. I cannot resonate more with what you're talking about here. This is, a, yes, of course, and it makes complete sense. Now, I will say personally, guys, I have, I'm from Texas in the United States, right? I'm born and raised about 45 minutes from, I was born 45 minutes from here, and I'm 41. So I've spent 41 summers in Texas. They've all been hot, and I've been here for a long time. But in Texas, there's a large German influence and a large German history here. And actually, my lineage is of Irish, we'll whisper that part, but of German descent uh, strongly. And then Daniel and I connected. I feel he's my brother from your side of the world over there. And we've just got a fascinating relationship with being able to connect over the mysteries, over the amazing things. And I've got to say also, uh, just as an American, that it's amazing what you guys are doing, where you're having a marathon in a few different languages. You're then converting those languages. Uh, you know, when Daniel overdubs my voice in your language, it's fascinating to me uh, what you guys are able to achieve. But by breaking that barrier and for it not being a limitation, you've transcended these boundaries. That's what I find so wonderful about my relationship with Daniel in particular, and now, of course, my new family here, and thank you guys for welcoming me open-armed, is that it's just such a cool thing that we have so many fascinating things to ping off of one another. Like, I've got stories in Texas y'all probably have never heard of, but all of you have fascinating places and interesting accounts that you visited with as well that I'm blown away by that actually are incredibly integral parts to new insights into the phenomena it, it's really interesting to start making some really interesting connections so again uh, to the connections part of it i'm grateful to be here guys this is outstanding yeah. it's awesome it's awesome you joined us and since our topic today is archaeology and um human history I was thinking, since you had some very interesting guests already, how many shows have you recorded since you started, by the way? Uh, recorded is, I don't know, but put out, um, I'm about to release episode 267 today. Like, it will come out today. But that's not including all the bonus content we've done, the lives, the content you and I have done. It's well over 300-something uh, episodes, and not including any of the guest spots that I've been on, which are in the hundreds yeah. as well. So it's been a lot, dude. It's crazy. And you have, you have, you've had some uh, very interesting guests who touched the topic of uh, human history and archaeology. Um, so tell us about a few of your most interesting guests when it comes to these kind of topics. Uh, a few of my favorite, there's some OG ones that you guys would love. Uh, Michael Cremo. Do you remember him? He went on uh, Coast to Coast AM all the time, and he's been on a few of the Ancient Aliens, I think, but just an awesome dude. And so I got to sit down with him, and that was just a fascinating, you know, the forbidden archaeologist, right? So we talked about all kinds of stuff. Um, the other one would be Brad Olson. Uh, he's wonderful, same kind of credentials, outstanding dude. Um, uh, forbidden archaeology is his occult yeah, his occult forbidden archaeology type work is absolutely fascinating and paramount. He runs around with Linda Moulton Howell, and they do some very interesting work together as well. So having those guys on, but there are a few nuggets uh, out there that aren't in the mainstream, as I would call them, but they're, God, they've been some of my favorite conversations, which is, you guys know how this works. Uh, there's a guy in particular that comes to mind uh, very recently that I just had back on the show was Larry Paul. Now, he is the uh, president of the American Pyramid Association. He goes over to Egypt constantly. And my events actually will take us over to Egypt. And, you know, uh, Gunnar, we, you and I probably have some crossover where we can set up some events uh, together here, bud. Um, now, uh, we'll be going over there to Egypt quite a bit, but Larry works uh, on this amazing style of looking at the pyramids and the entire Giza complex as being a big mathematical riddle. And he sees... Things like the stairway, which um, is just this amazing piece of, uh, it's stairs that just start in the middle of nowhere. They go down a certain amount of feet, and it's all filled with trash and everything. But he noticed that how many steps were there, the length that it took, the width of the structure that you're able to walk in, as well as the direction that it pointed, pointed to an, um, a meteor impact that was also then considered sacred, but it wasn't connected in the literature. So he found all of this stuff. So Larry is one of the most fascinating guys. He also goes down into the Tomb of the Birds, which is very unexplored um, and just an interesting dude. Another one uh, that comes to mind is an Argentinian uh, archaeologist that I got connected with, a guy named Jose Miguel Perez Gomez. And this guy is 
fascinating. He is like the South American Indiana Jones. He goes, he found El Dorado, the lost city of gold. He found a 17, he found a fleet of Spanish ships lost since the 1700s in the Caribbean. Just, he goes, yeah, yeah, it's right over there and found it. Um, another thing he's really famous for and, and has been on the show a couple times for is his petroglyph and um, his work with cave art and petroglyphs. And he can show these fascinating correlations between undiscovered petroglyphs, their track through North America, and how they point to a lost civilization that migrated all based on the art. And he's got this heart and reverence for it that when he speaks about it, you get goosebumps. You sit here and say, oh, my God, this guy like really feels this and he can see this playing out in history right in front of him, the way he speaks about how they did the art and putting his himself in the mind of the people doing it and how it was a manifestation technique and how they were teaching this to their children and how they could call the herds and just this relationship to the art that then depicts their relationship to the world around them. So these folks with these reverences for archaeology and all of it mysterious. Now you can say the the former two have been pretty, you know, um, basic, and they are. You don't have to get freaky woo-woo with things to be uh, amazing here, as Robert Schock showed us uh, with Dr. Anthony West when they talked about the Sphinx enclosure, right? That's basic raw science that just proves what they're talking about is horseshit. Uh, and then you also have Egyptologists can't agree on shit, right? Nobody can. Um, but then also just sort of the idea that they found the pyramids, and they'll openly talk about this. There's, there's hieroglyphs of them and artwork in the pyramids and in other temples depicting them uncovering the pyramids but not building them so that's a very like important distinction that even even the egyptologist just as indigenous cultures in this country say you know we found this shit we didn't build this you know so it's very interesting then to say well how far does history go back and what does that look like and now this is all just linear time we're talking about we're not getting into the freaky woo woo uh howdy mikowski's resets and the you know the phoenix cycles of uh Jason Bashirs and these folks that uh, think of a reset in terms of a simulation and all of that. So fascinating things to contemplate, but a lot of interesting folks with a lot of fascinating perspectives. Do you have any archaeo some kind of strange archaeology in, in Texas over there? Um, I'm sure we we do have some interesting things. I know the hammer that was found in coal. Are you uh, familiar with the term UPAS? The out of place objects. It's an acronym, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So they found an UPA, a famous UPA here in Texas, in East Texas, I believe. And it was a hammer. It was an absolute wood handle, uh, wood handle iron head hammer that was found in 400 million year old coal or something like that. So where it's just so old. And then we start speculating about time travelers coming back then, just accidentally dropping their hammer when they're working on lunch or something, and then getting back in the time machine and going back. And then they're like, oh, I left my hammer. They're like, don't worry about it. You know, there, there are so many interesting things with uh, when it comes to UPAs especially things like frogs being found in sediments of coal, millions of years old, absolutely alive in a rock when they break it open. Things like that, just weird stuff. Um, but I know also out here we have uh, the Aurora case, which is fascinating, and that could be considered archaeology because they dumped all the stuff in the well, um, and that's over here in East Texas. But, yeah, there's some fascinating things, and Texas is huge. So we have a, a lot of history, a lot of culture here as well, um, and a lot of weird, freaky woo-woo paranormal spots, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I found interesting is these uh, traces, dinosaur traces. Uh, with the, at the same time, we have uh, human footprints. So this makes you think, what the fuck happened there? So You guys can Google Glen Rose, Texas. It's just down the road from me, actually. It's 45 minutes. When the wife and I had a motorcycle. We rode there. We've been there a few times. And there are dinosaur tracks in the riverbed, but there's also footprints, human footprints there that are that call into yeah. question sort of the timeline, right? Yeah, what do you think when you when you hear about or see stuff like that? Do you does it make you rethink uh, history or, I mean, oh, I've been rethink anyways. Re but <laughs> I've been rethinking history for a long time. Uh, it's important <laughs> to consider that I think that that word on the outside of those textbooks just simply means his story. It doesn't mean the truth. It doesn't mean like what actually went down from all perspectives included because it's very redacted and we all know that. But also any history that you get is told from the perspective most often of the victor. So you're going to get a very reductive form of what they're calling actuality and actual reality. And it's, again, filtered through their perspective. So I think history happens through your own eyes. Anything other than that, it's kind of a crapshoot because outside of that, you can't control your observations of. So anything, the measurements taken, any of the building blocks between our history and then now this should occur because that 
happened in the past, like anything like that needs to be absolutely reconsidered when we talk perception. And then that's why the, uh, the idea of physical evidence here or history itself in linear time or anything like that is fascinating because you call, let's say, Howdy Minkowski's um, ideal where he, he touches a lot. He summarizes the work of the Catholics and the Gnost um the Gnostics and the Cathars, and what they talked about was this demiurge reality of a Sophia, you know, this uh, hellscape actually, that this is a carbon copy of what heaven could be or a matrix that's overlaid on it that could be also described as a simulated reality over hours that's not altruistic. And in this way then, um, you, you start to see this big picture ideal of maybe that everything uh, is in a simulated reality sort of put upon you in exactly the way it's supposed to. In some of these ideas, you can't prove that history didn't start this morning and that all of your memories are implanted and the sort of like a Dark City, the movie. Wonderful movie, uh, awesome. If you get the chance to check it out, it, they implant memories and they can implant the thought that you have had a history altogether at all. And so when you start to consider these things philosophically, it'll turn your stomach and it makes you nauseous and you start to say, hang on, so none of this could be real or... All of it could be simulated just beyond my perception and reach, and the answer is yeah, absolutely. And you can't prove that it's not. You can't prove it is, can't prove it's not. It's one of those uh, mind fucks, man. It is. Yeah, I know this mind fucks very well, yeah. Uh, in uh, my opinion, my life seems like to be a, a great adventure to understand with uh, how many shit I was connected with I was born. And then I have to go my own way and then we connected with the things I wanted to uh, connect it with. So this is this is for me the um, yeah, quest of my life and I think for all humanity. Sebastian nailed it. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's <laughs> the irreprovable. That's your controllable is what you have fact over and hold over. I think everything else is context to mold you and to allow you to grow. And to make your own discernment and, and decisions, and that may come down to the fact that it's real or not altogether. What what I find so great now again is that from from all these millions of people on this planet, there are only these these few of us which are connecting today. And to me, it seems that from my point of view, that on almost every spot of this planet, where there are interesting things going on sometimes weird things going on. Now I get more and more connection to at least one person, like from Texas, like one person from Australia, like one person from whatever, you know? And this is this is great to to have this chance to to meet you you guys all one after one. Daniel and me, we also also Sebastian, we don't we don't know each other for so long. It's about a year now, you know, since these connections started. And it really seems to me that this is growing and I, I really like this. This is really, really great what's going on right now. And we share so many interests, not just one thing. You know, I can see a guitar hanging uh, or is it the bass? What what you have hanging? Yeah, it's, in, a, there, it's a guitar. There? Yeah, that thing went to China with me, actually. I was a touring musician for 12 years all over uh, the country in the U.S. And then um, that, that thing is also carved. I didn't grab it off the wall there, but it's hand carved by me by a tiny little screwdriver. And so it's very intricate carvings on the top of it. Um, and then the one I use now is over here. So that one's kind of retired. Uh, I did a lot of so, percussion stuff while playing. So it kind of split a little bit. So I kind of just put her up. Mm, this is, this is just the next point. Danny and me realized this a while ago that so many people who are into any of these topics are, are also connected to music, you know, yes. this, I'm this also surrounded, I, I too. just can't, this is, you see, I have a baby, I have American support, you know, here in, 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 in my, oh, this, Les Paul, very nice, yeah, she's turning 30 this year, you know, beautiful, well, congratulations, happy birthday, and This is this is just great. I'm also surrounded with many many other instruments. I own uh, at least now I think seven guitars, and I like this. This is also part of my work. You know my approach. I'm also not a studied archaeologist or any of these things, but my approach. I think you did. You see some of the pictures from from the cave where I'm working in. I did. Where I'm and doing they look this amazing. frequency research. Yes, but I would be and down to is, see them again. You know, I'm I'm just. I'm just, yeah, I can try to give one one example here, like Zuck 
for people who don't know this, this, this stuff. Yeah. This is my resonance chamber. And you, you can see in this case, there are these five chapters carved, let's say carved. Now we don't really know how it was made, but we have these five segments. And as a musician, it to me, it, it, it points at uh, pentatonic scales, you know? And this, this is how I approach these things. And the first, even the first time when I entered this cave, I immediately realized that there are some uh, strange acoustical properties. And since then, I try to work more and more uh, around this stuff and find out more and more things. And since we know from other places like the King's Chamber in the, in the Big Pyramid or uh, Malta, this, this hypogeum, that most of these places are resonating with this 432 hertz. I actually expected it to be the same here, but my measurements show that it's it's 435. And this is a very, very interesting frequency. And since I'm very interested in this, I made more and more research about this frequency itself. So, and I found uh, from, uh, I think he, he's from Switzerland. This guy, his name is Hans Kostow. He's a mathematician actually. And, and together with a guy from Berlin, they started what they call Akasha Project. And they made electronic music, but with uh, frequencies and sounds, which are inducing feelings like you would smoke weed or if you would like to take uh, LSD, you know. And they, they succeeded with these things. And they made infrared spectral analysis of these molecules. And interestingly, it, one, one of these frequencies re resonating in, in, in CBD, THC, or LSD is around this 435 hertz. And if you are working uh, with, with frequencies in, in, in regards of healing, the 435 hertz can be used to harmonize our chakras. You know, and from from then on, it's getting it's getting interesting. It can't be there is no such thing as as coincidence for me. You know, and no. and this doesn't happen by by accident. I have no clue, no idea how old this piece here is, and who really built it, and therefore I'm I'm after the use. You know, what what did they use it for, or what is possible? What can I do with these things? And this is just great that we find more and more places around the world and people like we are, you know, going there really, really open-minded and not, not being, you know, full of pictures from like this, this academic point of view, you know? Um, and I, I think that we will really find out great, great things. What we can do this, I, I provide this for the people after a while, at least the, the, the research results, what kind of frequencies can we use. I'm giving uh, workshops for, for how, how to tune your guitar in, 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 in solfeggio frequencies. You know, a friend of mine recalculated this, that, that I can give you this list. There's Please, no, yeah. no worries. You know, you can easily... Uh, tune your guitar into healing frequencies, not just 432 hertz. That sounds amazing. I'm, I'm absolutely, yes, please send it. Yeah, we'll do the email thing, and, and I'm very interested in this, but it's all frequency. That's what this comes down to, which is so interesting. We talk about cymatics and frequency and vibration, and sort of the display is talking back, back to history of the old buildings and the cymatic patterns in the windows of the churches, and it's it, they reflected what the wind, what the building structure itself resonated at. So it was sort of a billboard. It said, hey, if you know this flower pattern, this is the type of healing we do here. And it's so interesting to me that it was a visual representation. And then also you sort of look at the corollaries between what that looks like moving from one, I guess, frequency to another. And that's analogous to sort of what we all experience in 2020. I think that the, you know, some frequency was changed globally whatever you want to say about whatever mm -hmm. happened, but a frequency pinged out and we all got in a destabilized place from our normalized fixed position that we were kind of comfortable in. And then it, the system flipped. If you've ever seen the cymatic patterns, when they do that, the sand goes everywhere and it goes nuts, but then it reforms into a new beautiful and more complex 
pattern. And I feel that that's what this whole transition is going to be about is this sort of cymatic yeah. representation, but it all comes back to frequency. So I love that you put that out. And I love that you noticed, because I noticed my first year in the show too, I'm like, you're a musician too? You've had these, these, these experiences, but you're also a musician. I would notice instruments or people would mention this, but it is a fascinating correlation between the two, musicians and people interested in Freaky Woo Woo or have, that have had amazing experiences, yeah. Sebastian. Just just one funny thing for me, because you said we are all musicians. I'm not a mus musician, but I have a um, radio show five years ago for two years, and uh, I was called as frequency switches, and uh, it takes a long time to understand what I really mean with this. <laughs> you have a musical mind, you know? You can yeah. tell, you can see it in the way that you see things, and especially if you're audio-centered, that's artistic, man. Whoever tells you it's not to run a board, to balance EQs, you know, the give and take, to understand the give and take uh, of audio and production is huge, man. So you're an instrument for damn sure. You're a composer. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Michael. What's up? How are you doing? Good. How's it going? Good, good. Thank you. Awesome. We are, we are, we are really having great times. Hello, Michael. Well, welcome to the show. First of I, all, I, I would like to ask you, do you, do you two guys know each other? Here on, uh, on, on the bottom. I've seen him. Dude. I'm familiar with your work, brother, but it's nice to meet you officially unofficially, right? We'll connect for sure. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you yeah. as well. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. So we are actually doing very good now. We are we are totally exactly where we should be since Michael was scheduled at eight o'clock our time. And I'm happy again that this worked. We had some issues today in, in the start, and it seems now uh, Richard. Uh, he's not gonna come come back today. He's yeah. He he needs to take care of his heart. He's waiting for a heart surgery within the next few weeks. So, ask him that we will find another uh, appointment. And yeah, we are in contact. It doesn't matter. So what 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 what's going on on your side, Michael? I I try to find what what you sent me to provide. Yeah, maybe fill us uh, fill us in uh, the, on the topic that you wanted to talk about today. Um, absolutely, absolutely yeah i um well i recently got back from peru and um, that was just a few weeks ago i um uh saw all the sites and did all the things all the main stuff but the main reason that i went down there was to uh work this theory that i've been um kind of developing on the band of holes site in peru and it's an unexplained site for those that aren't familiar uh, with it of about 6,000 holes in a band that go up the side of Mount Sierpe out near Ica in Peru, which is out near the coast. Um, it's fairly close to the Nazca lines, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on out there. Um, but uh, for almost 100 years now, there's been no solid explanation for what this site was used for. Um, and various theories have been posited from uh, graves and mass grave to... Uh, tribute holes and stuff like that. So I started doing some research and uh, what I found were agricultural techniques being used in the uh, Canary Islands um, on the volcanoes there. So they have similar climates, similar stuff. And when I saw the two images side by side, I, I just clicked for me. And so when I went down there, um, documented the site, got a lot of good drone footage, and I'll be heading over to the Canary Islands here in two weeks to um, talk to horticultural specialists and about their agricultural techniques and stuff over there. They've been doing this for quite a long time in the vineyards over there. So what they grow over there is grapes and um, connecting those two pieces. So hoping to, to solve this mystery of what the band of holes is in Peru after about a hundred years of, uh, of documenting and research on that, on that site. So we'll see, what we come up with, but uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty encouraged by it. Um, they're using these techniques um, that look almost identical across the entire uh, um, continent of Africa. It's called the Great Green Wall, and they're doing that to stop the spread of the Sahara Desert. So this is, and Peru is obviously famously well known for their ability to terraform their environment from these um the the uh um the ledges what it's slipping my mind right now terraces and uh um 
their irrigation system, their 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 advanced irrigation systems in the areas and stuff like that. So I felt I feel like this really falls in line with that. And from what I've seen firsthand with the uh, with the uh, band of holes now, um, in comparison, I think we're kind of on track here, which is which is definitely encouraging and exciting stuff. So that's kind of my main focus right now. I'll be working on cart ruts over there as well. We have cart ruts where I'm at in Austin, Texas, in the U.S., and I've documented those recently. And so I can't pass that up. There's cart ruts in the Canary Islands as well as Malta, which I'll be going to as well. So I'll be doing some comparison work on that also. Mike, first of all, fascinating. Second of all, you know we're neighbors. I live three hours away from him in Millsap, Texas, near Fort Worth. My wife and I have eight acres out here. Really? Yeah, well, dude, we got to connect, man. We yeah. got to connect, We got to connect. Yeah. We're going to be down there for the... Uh, um, fellow Texan. Yeah, we're going to be down there for the event uh, in April, the solar eclipse event. So we'll, we'll get connected. Yeah, where, but this where is are you awesome. going about? Uh, there's two, the Convergence and then the Utopia one for contact at the Canyon with Grimerica. They have a whole thing with the Snake Bros Ranch out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They gave me an invite, but I'm doing the um, – I'm, I'm hanging with some friends here locally. Uh, they, I think they're down in Bandera, which is a few hours gotcha. south. Well, but, maybe uh, it's yeah, like absolutely. We gotta maybe pop by for a couple hours, man. We'll we'll make it work. But either way, yeah. fascinating what you're talking about. And I love the I love though the fact that it's not it doesn't need to be aliens to be awesome. Like maybe it's aliens, <laughs> maybe they taught them the technique and they burn the holes in the wall with some super cool technology, but fascinating alone or some some amazing, you know, simple yet fascinating ex uh, explanations here because that takes I mean, what what then at that scale would you say would it take to create something like that where you found in Peru? There's the, if, if you guys are seeing that as well, it would take uh, quite a bit of work. Um, so the best example for work, if we're using a comparable site, is what they're doing at the um, Great Green Wall in Africa. Um, it takes about a full day for one person to dig one of these holes and create it and line it. So it takes about a day per hole per person. And there's around 6,000 of these holes stretching from where you see it going down into the valley there all the way up the sides of the mountains. Can we so that's a lot up? of holes. And Can if I remember correctly, it's about it, – it's alternating odd numbers somewhat. Um, they are in patterns, which is easier to see when you get directly overhead from, I believe, 979797. Um, and these, these holes are lined with rocks. Um at least partially on one side, which is very similar to the uh, techniques used in the Canary Islands and in Africa now in modern times. And they dig out the holes and then they use the dugout dirt to elevate around the hole as well. Now this would give you a um, blockage from the wind and dust that could be damaging to the crops. It also helps funnel dew down to the bottom. And then you're digging through that top layer of rock um, down to the soil so that the uh, um, any kind of agriculture that you're planting there so that it can take, take root. Now, this isn't usually my area of uh, interest in, in topics. I'm usually, you know, primarily focused on megalithic structures around the world. But this one just kind of fascinated me and I, it just kind of clicked and I couldn't help but follow up on it. But you can see there how it's all built in to the hole with uh rocks and stuff lining uh the uh insides of this hole <clears throat> but by the way uh michael sent me these pictures and i i'm just trying to show you some of them and i'm scrolling around here it's not done by him i see the pictures also for the first time now yeah this is incredible just just keep telling us about this i will just open the next picture uh, sure yeah now. the um the site there stretches for about a mile um, or a little over. And, um, you know, the the culture in Peru responsible for some of the biggest marvels of agricultural engineering um, would have created the, the space for some of the incredible things that we see on display all throughout the country. Now, Peru is, in my opinion, probably one of the most significant place sites and places and regions on the planet, even more so than some places like Egypt, I think. Uh, you have pyramids there that predate e the Egyptian dynasties um, at Kural. Um, you have examples of almost every major type of 
megalithic construction from what looks like geopolymer type of um, rocks and melting and working of stone to absolutely perfectly cut looking stone as well. Um, and so, you know, from Machu Picchu to Saxe, Uman, um, you know, to other incredible examples all throughout the country. Uh, but you can see there from that overhead uh, perspective. Now, on the left, this is one of the big holes. Uh, there's There were only really two that we identified at the very front. And they looked more like may, perhaps they would have been buildings, but those are bones inside of them. Now, I don't think those bones had anything to do with coming up out of these, um, these specific sites. It seems more like they were dumped there, but they did look like human bones, which kind of set a creepy mood for us when we first walked up onto the site. Not to mention that as we got about midway up, um, when we looked back, someone had come over and set a fire by our vehicle. Um, so it, it um, uh, kind of hastened right our, our, our journey a, a little bit. Uh, uh, I was with a group of other is uh, it, content creators, Nikki Anna Jones is, and Will from Incredible History. Uh, do, do you have any knowledge if there is some underground uh, structures below these places? We don't, but I, I would tell you, if you get onto um, Google Earth and you look at the area, um, so if you, if you come in on Google Earth or just maps, Google Maps, and you go in on this location, you can simply look up Mount Sierpe and then Band of Holes. You'll see off to the right and left that it does look like there are um, possibly other types of structures up into the hills. Now, whether those, I haven't walked those areas, but that's one of the larger um, sites. Th th that is, that's uh, unique and not typical of the rest of the holes there. But Maybe. that is one of the larger, larger Michael, holes at the very beginning of the band of holes. Michael, I'm but sorry. You can have a bit of fun exploring on the maps there up and down the sides of the mountain range. It does look there like there's possibly um, some other. Now, there's other sites in that whole area. That whole area was used. There are other ruins all throughout that that valley um, and that, that are known. But what's so cool about Peru is that there is still so much that's unknown. Um, you know, there's quarry evidence of quarrying right in the city of Cusco that's, that's not even identified on the map that um, surely is known about it. Um, it's right next to the uh, aquifer, the um, aqueduct there in town. But um, yeah, it was a very interesting trip. We had just done the Nazca lines right before this, which was a site that I had always regretted not doing on my previous trip to Peru. Um, and so I was very fortunate enough to be able to do that this time. Um, and I'll be going back to Peru in October and um, I'm hosting a tour down there that goes live today um, at uh, four and uh, for October. So it'll be a tour group there, but then I'm going to be staying on a week or two after that to go back here to the, um, to the Band of Hole sites and see some other stuff. Hopefully get back down into Bolivia. I'd like to see uh, a few other things there in Bolivia again. But that's the Canary Islands right there. So, you know, you can kind of see the, the the comparison that I was drawing from looking at the these agricultural sites in the Canary Islands. These are vineyards. Hmm. Maybe I missed it. The the structure we you shown us before, or Guna showed us before. How long is the structure? It's a bit over a mile. A mile. Mile long. And um, stretches all the way up into the mountains there, Mount Sierpe, and, um, down from the valley. Yeah. And does all these, uh, it looks like trenches. Did, did, was all these trenches, um, can you say they were built by hand? These these little rocks? At the band of holes in Peru? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's stacked rocks and stuff lining the holes. 
So yeah, they're all built behind. Okay, um, yeah. To me, it looks like yeah. branches or something. It could could be a gravesite too, of course, but over a mile. That's so the like... common, you know, the the originally in nineteen in the nineteen forties or fifties, late forties, fifties, early fifties, um, a gentleman named Von Hagen, I believe, if I'm getting that correct, um, identified the area. He did archaeological research there and identified the area as being grave sites. Now. Um, you know, the, uh, the, um, there aren't, it, it, some of that just doesn't make sense to me when you walk the site, there aren't really spacing for like walking and movement between, um, there isn't, you know, if it, if it was a grave site, it would have been some, it, 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 it would be more likely to me logically that it would be a mass grave site of uh, just unknown people perhaps but why would you stretch it in a singular pattern all the way up the side of the mountain because it goes up into um yeah. much higher elevation but not, and, i guess not every culture wants the grave sites to be walked on so I'm, i'm not sure about that but yeah you've got a point there of course maybe it was a conquered civilization that they took over dug the grave so that they could sort of the enemies could see, you know, sort of as a monument to their destruction, or maybe it was spiritual in nature to where they lined the pathway of souls up this particular mountain. And, you know, mountains were revered for the placements of where you could connect with the gods. That's where hierophanies occur, right? Where the gods come down to earth and visit humans is that's where they hang out. So it's interesting. It's location. Do you think, and can we just rule out, I'm just curious. I know that you said that they are now filled with rocks, but we also see evidence of ancient civilizations coming along and taking advantage of the technology of an earlier civilization that they can't credit any knowledge of. Let's say Baalbek, for instance, right? Uh, how they built on the top of those stones. But in this instance, could it be something that maybe as fanciful as it sounds, and I know I mentioned that maybe it doesn't need to be freaky woo-woo, but maybe an ancient machine of some type that left those impressions that somebody then maybe found at a later civilization said, you know what, if we stack rocks in here, we can actually protect from uh, the weather and stuff. It was fortuitous that this... UFO type machine just happened to land right here for a little bit and take off. Um, you know, the, uh, we don't have any other, it's just one singular track. Um, the, the stones, the way the circles, because because of the patterning and the, and the layout, it seems very intentional in their, in the, um, patterning in which they're laid out. Um, and, The, the picture that we're on right here, we um, th that's not the typical formation for the entire band of holes. This is found at the uh, front of the site. So this this one right here clearly looks more like the foundation of a structure down at the bottom of the base of the band of holes where it all starts. Um, and while we are looking at a site with bones in it, as far as the graves part has um, is concerned, we there's never been found any types of bones or human remains. Um, or anything else as far as the other theories that around based around tribute holes and things like that. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of a good picture there. The elevation is is hard to tell, but it does go quite a ways up. And you don't I, I've spent some time looking. Um, you don't have this uh, anywhere else in the region. There isn't another band like this um you can find examples i think of holes and different stuff that are kind of maybe constructed but not uh, not like this and not to this extent and um now it is possible that entire areas have been washed out you can see that there's ravines going from the top of the mountain down um could other things be what have been have existed and been washed out um yeah i i i suppose so um But these do maintain their shape over the contour of the land as far as like their depth and construction, which is interesting. So as you can see there about in the middle of the picture, you have these dips mm -hmm. and the holes go in alignment with that. Um, uh, there are areas where there's breaks and gaps. Um, you can kind of see one um, here towards, towards the middle where there's a space of no holes. And those kind of are per periodically going up the band of holes. You find them every so often. 
but it's an interesting site and um, looking forward to kind of exploring that, bringing more attention to it. Um, Cause the entire area is fascinating. This is, this is where you're getting into all the Nazca lines and different stuff. A lot of unexplained things, Paracas, the Paracas skulls are out there and uh, very nearby. And, uh, a lot of stuff like that. Hey, Michael, is there any reference point or, or is there any chance to tell if this structure was made over a long period of time or was it made or was it built in one, so to speak? I mean, it took a long time probably, but you know what I mean? Is there any is there any chance or reference point that, that tells us this was built over the course of, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, two years, 100 years and... Another question, I will add another question. Did you find any rocks or stones, something like that, that were out of the ordinary? Did you find extraordinary stones or or, or, or artifacts, stuff like that? No. Um, it's from, as far as I know, nothing's ever been found um, in the holes. Um, and... Could this have been done in phases, so to speak? Is that kind of what you're asking? Like, could there have been then sections and then at a later date sections? I, I imagine so. Um, um, but I think they date it back to the um, mid 1400s to 1500s. But I tend to also take with a grain of salt dates that are thrown to me from experts. Uh, um You know, I've seen too many examples around the world that just don't really fit that narrative, specifically um, traveling to China and places like that. When you get to the Yangshan Quarry, China, when I visited and documented the Yangshan Quarry, they have a date of creation there for about 1400s. And Yangshan Quarry has all the telltale signs of megalithic construction that typically date far back much further Yeah. Than, than that with nubs and machining and tool marks and um, lots of different types of stone working um, there in China. Um, and then when you get to Peru, also the dates, you know, you, you can literally see the levels of, of um, like loss of technology mm -hmm. for a lot of these sites. So you can be walking around the streets of Cusco and see these megalithic blocks perfectly fitted together. And then right above stacked on top of that is ancient stoneworking that's very precise and it, it has precision fittings and everything else, but they aren't these megalithic blocks. And then above that you have, which that second layer I believe is actually the Inca. And then above that you have Span you know, Spanish influence, which is basically just stacking rocks mm -hmm. and using mortar. And then above that you have modern construction which is even worse, right? So it looks like the further back we go, the more advanced people were. Yeah. Um, and we've lost a lot. I of agree with the technology. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, just, just, just a second, Michael. Uh, Daniel, I asked Richard and Matt again, since the next half an hour is actually my spot, And we could give it a retry, you know, and, and all you, you guys, you just don't stay with us. If we can manage this now, this time to bring Matt Turner and Richard Gabriel into, into the game for the next half an hour until uh, Gabriela is, is uh, it, it's on her turn. Uh, it, this would be great. Just I, I didn't intend now to really interrupt you. You still have time to go. I will see if I can manage this. Yeah. Michael. What have you, what have you done in, uh, let's say, the course of your research to make sense of the structure? What if you, what did you try out? Have you observed it from 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 the plane? What what did you do? Did you, have you did you did you so, sit in it? <laughs> I don't know, man. What, what, what <laughs> yeah, you, no, I, I did would, get in the holes. I would do and... every, I would do anything. I would try out anything to try to make sense of this of this fucking structure because it's awesome. I would <laughs> watch it from 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 I don't know maybe satellite pictures from plane. I would sit in it. I would I don't know. So I have. I've released two, two. Keep in mind, I was just there two weeks ago. So, but I have already released two uh, drone videos that 
give you um, an absolutely amazing perspective of the entire area and the site. Those are out now on my uh, channel, Wandering Wolf, on YouTube. And um, I have plenty of pictures and different stuff. I'm currently working on a um, full-length video to kind of explain what I'm working on. And I'm hoping to have that out here in the next week or so. And then what I'll be doing is um, uh, releasing a lot of that, that footage, those pictures and different stuff, the full-length video, it's describing some of this. And what I'm doing next is in two weeks, traveling over to the Canary Islands to document the modern techniques used that are comparable to this so that I can see exactly and make comparisons to these structures and, and look at their viability. Now, obviously, I think what we really need is lab testing done for samples taken out of these holes and seeing if we can find any type of organic matter that possibly still exists there, things that we can test for and actually get back our data. This is pretty similar to some of the work that I've done up in Sage Wall in Montana. Um, we've been testing and um, getting lab results back up there for that site, um, which has had some interesting results. And so hopefully that's where this will progress to. Um, as far as uh, the upcoming months, I'll have those even more videos being released about the Van Hole sites and then this comparison video after going to the Canary Islands and documenting all of that. Um, so, yeah, uh, if the if the idea kind of sticks and gains some traction, maybe we can get some kind of, um, you know, authorization for some better and further testing. The problem a lot of times is, is if you don't have certain letters behind your name, nobody nobody listens to you unless you make enough noise. Yeah. Um, and then they want to come in and take over uh, everything so that they can kind of control the release of information. Yeah. We know the um, luckily, with the work that I've done up in Montana at Sage Wall with the property owner there, who's amazing, Chris and, and Linda, um, they uh that's on private land so they have authorized all that type of work and um, are even funding a lot of it themselves which is great it's i can help it but this structure to me it looks like trenches like war trenches i imagine people the warriors line lane in every every in every single hole is a warrior line and and from the left or from the oh. right no there's some there's you, some, you there's call some. that up a foxhole. I served in the army. I was in the infantry and we've, I've dug a few, I've dug a few foxholes, but generally you wouldn't build so many like one after the other behind each other. If you were facing one direction, you know, you want line of sight. So you would kind of ar arrange things in sections that are offset from each other so that you're not shooting it at, at each other, so to speak, or having accidental fire. And when you're nine rows deep, like you are here in a row, um, but I don't know, you know, maybe if you're shooting arrows, you can just launch them up and not worry about that. I'm very much thinking of how we did stuff with, with guns. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, you know, you, it kind of is this curving band that goes up the side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but if it was uh, war trenches, you would you would find uh, remains and, and shit. You would think, right? Yeah, and artifacts and stuff like area. that. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, which you think? As you can see in this picture, even today, still to this day, the the valley and everything is heavily in use for agriculture. That's all that is down there, and all the green areas. That's all farming. Yeah. And then you have a very different type of terrain. As the uh, as it as it changes there into the foothills and then on up into the mountains. Yeah, Kuna is blocking our picture right now. Oh, here we go. That just you know. yeah. It's fast. Your theory is so fascinating, dude. I mean, the more you look at it, um, the more interesting it is, dude. And it's I mean, heading down the mountain like that, of course, you'd put it strategically like that. It also seems some of the clear paths that you were talking about, accessibility points, if you will, are sort of taking advantage of the ridge where not meant, you know, maybe much water would be collected. So mm. it's kind of like putting a gutter on the top of your house and it sort of takes advantage of that in that far hill there. It's just interesting, man. I love the perspective and you can see it being of use to a population. Do you think that place 
the area itself supports the idea that that scale of architecture or agriculture rather would be needed in that area? Yeah, so if you look into the um, the past of the region, the, there was a major uh, Incan highway, the name of which escapes my uh, memory at the moment, that went through this area. And um, all of this would have been farmland, and there are other ancient ruins up and down the area. So, um, you know, this very possible that this area right here supported a, a, quite a large population as an agricultural center. I need to do a bit more research on that before I kind of, put my stamp of approval on that theory, but um, this is really the, 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 the theory that I'll be working towards just exploring. All the other ideas have been explored, but then they just kind of seems like they've stepped away from it um, as far as graves. Um, I mean, there's books out on that, um, which eventually have been kind of, you know, it, it's, it's still is suggested, but I don't think it's widely accepted anymore as others, archaeologists have done research um even recently i think two gentlemen who's again their names escape me they were out in peru researching and uh um had a, had some time to pop over and see see this area and their theory with a minimal amount of research i might add was that it uh was tribute holes which again the any kind of stuff that would be used for, I don't know, you know, I like to think that those bands might signify different re areas of different types of crops. You know, they've, it's well established, at least with, with within the Incas, that as they terrace certain areas, that, you know, one layer was specifically for one type of crop and one layer was for another, as some did better at higher elevations. So perhaps those breaks in the bands were areas of delineation um, between specific types of crops now um but i don't know you know i'll have to just keep it so i'm very at the very beginning stages of this um right now all i've done is document the actual site band of holes and so i'm hoping to kind of learn a lot more as i immerse myself over in the canary islands with the understanding of their agricultural techniques specific to them that seems so similar to this site and we'll be able to make a comparison but it would very much you know kind of lend an a be even better understanding of to, to kind of what that area was used for um and uh as we see now we're just kind of figuring some of the you know we're supposed to be so advanced as a human culture across the world but we're just figuring some of these techniques out now to in order to prevent things like um, you know, uh, a massive type of deforestation and, and damage to areas like in Africa from the Sahara Desert encroaching on um, uh, green land. And they're using these techniques to stop that, which is pretty interesting. So like I said before, this is a little bit outside of my normal area of focus, usually being megalithic sites and massive ancient places like Baalbek yeah. or Cambodia yeah. or places I've been in China, but um, it, it's a, it's an interesting little puzzle, which, which is uh, kind of got me, got all my attention right now. Uh, this, this would be uh, the keyword. Now we could try another time, uh, Daniel, to try if we can be, bring Richard into, into the game. Uh, he's, he's still here. I didn't reach Matt for now, but we will see. Maybe he will come back later. And yeah, just try. Uh, I think Richard should be in the waiting room. No. 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 Okay. While you That guys are transitioning, I actually need to go. I've got another commitment. But this was awesome, guys. This was absolutely incredibly cool. Mike, dude, uh, we've got to connect for the research. is fascinating. Oh, yeah. And then also, it looks like uh, honeycombs. You know, honeycomb um, compartments. Like yeah, it does. Efficient structure for storing. Uh, and, and all your work, guys, Every everything about this is amazing. Thank you so much for the invite, Daniel. And um, let's do it again for damn sure. Thank you all so much. We will. Thank you so much, Brandon. Great to connect. Yeah.